Good morning from Miami Beach, home of Neurosurgical TV. We have another uh, episode of Yuha's Neurosurgical Grand Rounds. He has a special guest, Ali Chris, today, and I'll let Yuha introduce him. Welcome, Yuha. Okay, dear colleagues, we have a great honor to have a honorary <clears throat> guest speaker, Professor Ali Christ from Arkansas Neuroscience Institute, Little Rock, Arkansas. USA, he will speak about the cavernous sinus and the future of microneurosurgery. Uh, Ali Christ is born in Africa, Nigeria, to Lebanese parents. And then he graduated from, in Lebanon from American University in Beirut, 1985. At time there was a civil war in Lebanon and uh, in the following years he moved to USA where he became a neurosurgeon in Atlanta, 1994. And as a totally fresh young neurosurgeon, he joined, joined University of Arkansas, 1994, the same year he specialized. And there were two giants, Professor Yasakil and Armefti, and certainly this was the best possible training in the world for a young neurosurgeon. So two of the best neurosurgeons in the same institute. This is like a miracle for a young neurosurgeon. So after some uh, several years at the university hospital, uh, um, Professor Almefti left to Boston and uh, Ali Christ stayed in Little Rock and already that time he had plans for Arkansas Neuroscience Institute and these plans have now realized two years ago. This is the most beautiful institute for neurosurgery. Ali will show pictures in his presentation so we'll, you will see how well organized it is. Ali Christ is doing cerebrovascular surgery, skull base surgery, and pituitary surgery. He's extremely hard working. He operates stable at the highest level of skills. He's really one of the best neurosurgeons I have seen, and I have seen thousands of them during my long career. He has organized high number of life courses in home in Little Rock, but also joined abroad in Helsinki since 2004, Netherlands, Taiwan, nearly 20 years, and also has been here operating on in Zhengzhou in China. He's always performing well wherever he's operating on. He's a man you can trust in every aspect, and he's a neurosurgeon you can trust always. He has fellows around the world, now also from China, Tsai Li, several years, very talented young neurosurgeon. And uh, one of the high points in his career was the Oliver Kuna Prize given last year, 2019. This is called the Nobel Prize of Neurosurgery. It shows how high level is working all the time and he has so many years left in his beautiful very active institute. So I give now the word to Ali Christ for his presentation. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. <clears throat> Thank you, Johan. I, as you said, uh, uh, you're right. I am very lucky man to have landed the job when I finished. I also, I am became more lucky because I had more mentors in my journey, uh, like yourself, and 
like Professor de Oliveira. And uh, this, I don't really take credit for what I do. I give credit for my teachers. I, uh, anybody who doesn't acknowledge the people they, he learned from, uh, do not improve. I can say one thing, I tried my best to be a good student. Uh, nothing more, nothing less. And I hope I will stay like this. So I'm really honored uh, to be uh, under Yuha's uh, courses like this one. And I must say, Yuha and I have been friends now uh, for many, many years. It's getting close to 20 years. And uh, the way I knew Yuha is when Professor Yazagil visited with him and uh, he came back and uh, he said, listen, you have to go to Helsinki. There's a good man there and he's doing good surgery. You should go and see him. And he is doing amazing large amount of surgeries and he has a beautiful machinery that he has been working in. And actually, like I told you earlier, I use his, uh, his uh, uh, model that he ran uh, to use it a lot for what I am doing here because uh, anytime my administrators complain or my staff complain that they are busy or something, and I will use you as an example. I said, look, in Helsinki, they were doing in four operating rooms this much cases, we should be able to do the same. And, uh, and since then, we've had a very close friendship and it, I've been lucky to, to have met him also over the years. And uh, I can see one thing, wherever you are goes, there is an earthquake. He makes impact. And just like now, uh, he went to the, the largest populated uh, country in the world and he really brought uh, Chinese neurosurgery to the world and he brought the world to Chinese neurosurgery. And he became like this big gate that opened these two worlds together and we can feel it uh, by his presence there. So uh, thank you, Yuha, for all the teachings and the friendship. And uh, thank you for hosting me and for Zubin to do the translation. And uh, um, it's, it's really a, an honor for me. So today I, I'm talking about the future of microsurgery and the cavernous sinus because uh, the cavernous surgery is, a, is an area which we're unlocking. And if you look at the progression and the evolution of microsurgery, it has been uh, uh, through certain breakthroughs in certain disease entities. Uh, a good example is when Professor Yazagil in, introduced microsurgery, he made a breakthrough in aneurysm surgery. And then shortly afterward, he made really breakthroughs in glioma surgery and other, you know, extra axial tumor surgery. All these impacts for the, the big change, it's like quantum leaps in the outcomes of patients have taken place every time a new area is unlocked or explored or conquered in a way. And because there has been a lot of talk about microsurgery not being like popular or some people even said it is dying and there is no need for it and so on, uh, it became clear to me that there is a, not only misconception but lack of understanding and there's even a, a new population of neurosurgeons who not only they don't know but they don't know what they don't know. That's even more difficult. And, uh, and I thought, well, uh, this is an area which I've spent almost 30 years now uh, living in and around the cavernous sinus, and I know it very well. And now, the last few years, it became a, an easy area to operate on uh, and uh, to explore. So, and that, like you have said, came from a lot of learning that I did and teaching from my mentors 
who had a vision to establish a Mecca of micro neurosurgery, a place where people will make a pilgrimage to rejuvenate the uh, microsurgical uh, kind of uh, field. And this is our institute, which became a reality a couple of years ago. And it has the Yazergil Neurosurgery Research and Education Center. And uh, it also has a, um, a laboratory and facilities which are made uh, connected to this uh, hospital, which is predominantly a neurosurgical hospital. Next to it is a rehab. So it's like a small village in a way, and we're hoping to expanding further with high level research. This is uh, the main entrance of it, which leads to the other section where the Yazoga Neurosurgical Research and Education Center, which has in it an auditorium that is connected to the operating room. These are our fellows, and uh, it has a 3D capabilities through these uh, cameras and uh, connected to two operating rooms. And uh, you can sit here, put the 3D glasses and watch while we're connected to it. It also has the Osama Al Mefti Micro Neurosurgery Laboratory. And this is a uh, high level lab where each station simulates an operating room table. And uh, it has micro instruments, microscope, uh, the frames and everything. And of course, it's supported by the Abud model that Dr. Abud initiated of lifelike uh, surgery that we do. This is the Evandro de Oliveira conference room. And uh, Professor Evandro, as you all know, has unfortunately ALS. And uh, I still connect with him. And uh, this is the conference room where he uh, supported a lot of our courses and lectures over the years. And this is what we did like Yuha had in Helsinki. We are having our visitors uh, point their place of origin so we can remember them all. So when it comes to microsurgery, I'm going to use, go back to, to Professor Yazagil where he uh, started operating on gliomas of the insula. And at that time, the insular gliomas were considered non-operable. And the reason he was able to operate on them is he was able to see with a different eye. And that eye has a very strong basic knowledge of the anatomy and also a good clinical sense of the condition of the patient and a very high level microsurgical uh, capabilities. When he put those together, uh, it became clear to him that this is an operable lesion. It's not non-operable. And the reason being is these tumors are not really invading. They are expansile in the insula. And there is a way through the sylvium fissure that you can operate and stay within them. And since the patient was intact preoperatively, except possibly for seizures, then there is no reason why you cannot remove it safely. And he introduced this. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the colleagues who talk about insular gliomas, nowadays, they, they don't even mention Professor Yazergil, who, who was the leader. And there is even a trend of doing the surgery differently. When he has done it, you know, 30 years ago in the most beautiful way. And, and the reason he was able to see this, he, he developed that eye. And this is how, to me, the cavernous sinus is looked at nowadays. In the same way that insular glioma became a routine, uh, to me, cavernous sinus surgery is becoming a routine. It's routine for me, and I'm sure it's going to be routine for others. And I, I will use the same logic that Professor Yazagil uses. Uh, he always said it is wrong when people say, if Yazergil can do it, uh, but nobody can do it. He always felt whatever he can do, people should do it and should learn it and do it better. And uh, tomorrow he will elaborate on that. Tomorrow we have a webinar for those who are interested, which is at 
two hours, kind of uh, three hours later than the time of this webinar, which will be by Professor Yazagil and myself and Dr. Turi about the uh, story of aneurysms in a way and the future of aneurysm surgery. But this, this indicates that if we keep our focus on knowing the anatomy, the pathology, and the clinical uh, picture of the patient, we should be able to take tumors like this and understand where we should be in the surgery to avoid uh, risky spots and then to know where the traps are and then eventually achieve an outcome which looks like this. And uh, patients will benefit from this. So the same story goes with the uh, cavernous sinus and the region of the cavernous sinus. Now, for, for the young neurosurgeons, there's a lot of popular trends. And popular trends are driven by many factors. And you have to be careful. Other than, you know, some uh, teachings, or there is also a trend which is pushed by industry, by certain equipment, uh, by certain institutions, by insurance companies. There's so many factors that are pushing uh, the specialty to go in a certain way which becomes popular. And most people want to belong to be part of the popular, so there's a pressure to conform to it. But the popular may not be what's good for your patient. And that's becoming a problem. I just told you an example, a 37 year old uh, lady that I operated on her mom who had an AVM, she had an ACOM aneurysm that they suspected it ruptured two days before the, uh, uh, she presented. She was a, you know, Hunt and Hess grade zero by the time she came. Uh, this lady had an aneurysm that uh, in the right neurosurgical hands, it can be, it can be cured. Uh, she was treated endovascularly and uh, ruptured during the surgery, even though the picture was perfect. She had a perfect picture, but ended up catastrophic brain death from a major rupture. And that's, that's something that is being pushed in one way or another. And, and she was not even treated by a neurosurgeon, which, which you know, denied her the other option. Uh, and this creates a passive mind because when you accept what's popular, then you're no more thinking and you just take the information you're being given and you just regurgitate it because in, in familiar forms because people, that's what everybody is talking and then you end up just you know, uh, following the trend. And the trend is not going to be treating every patient at the highest level. And that's the problem that, that has been happening is, is all of a sudden the bar of our performance keeps going down over time. And we also lose a lot of young people who have great minds and to their creativity into a passive you know, conformed mind. While if we preserve these young people with their creative, inquisitive mind, they stay in an active form and then they take information and they digest it in a different way and they are become creators instead of consumers to what's popular. And that's something that has to be strengthened more because the population of neurosurgeons is a very small, highly selected group, which should be able to be much more creative and much more productive. We have not been. If you think about it, we still treat glioblastoma in the same way. We, you know, we may do a better surgery in some cases, give a little better improvement, but we only neurosurgeons are going to be able to really cure. Uh, cure it. So when it comes to microsurgery, we have to perform it at the highest level possible. And that is when you're able to see the operation and finish it and feel good about it and any time of the day. I remember when I was visiting Yuha the first time, 
he was operating till 7, 8 p.m. And then at 8 p.m. a ruptured aneurysm came. It was like a posterior communicating artery aneurysm. And uh, all what he did is he said, okay, we go. Why? Because in his mind, it was an easy task that he can finish. And then he put this case on the schedule. We started at 8.30. He had a great setup. And then by before 9.30 at the aneurysm clip and the fellows were closing. Why? Because he was able to see the finished work. And this is what Michael Angelo puts it very nicely. I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free. This is how we should approach our surgery. And this is how cavernous sinus surgery should be done, unlike what, how it has been done for, a, for a, the longest time, where people shied away from it because they had a lot of complications and problems. So that will give you the eye that you can see with your brain. And Professor Yazagir always talked about, you know, to be able to see with your brain eye and this is a completely different vision. It's one thing to see, and it's another thing to have insight into what you're doing. So in order to elevate this microsurgery to a level where it becomes the most superior option, you have to recognize that this has to go back to the basics. You have to master the basics. And what are the basics? It's anatomy. Remember, we operate on anatomy. And if you don't know anatomy inside out, you're not going to be able to perform at the highest level. It's very simple. And uh, only those who have mastered the knowledge of the area they're operating on and they're, they're living in. Uh, to me, I have lived in the cavernous sinus you know, I always say I have two homes, my, my home where I sleep and the cabinet of sinus is my second home. And that's where I know it very well. So knowledge of the anatomy should be extensive. You don't only say, I know the cabinet of sinus, I know what's in here, I know what's in there. Uh, this is V1, V2, V3, and so on. You should know the, the origin and the end, you know, uh, point of each nerve and how it crosses, how it relates to everything around it, and how it de gets deformed during pathological problems. And each disease has its own uh, distortion of the anatomy. And it's predictable. Diseases are not haphazard. In the same way you think of a tuberculum cell meningioma, that grows posteriorly and compresses the optic chiasm, and it also compresses the perforators, the superior perforators in a certain way. Cavernous sinus lesions do the same. If it comes from the pituitary gland, it behaves in one way. If, it, if it's a chordoma, if it's a lateral one or a medial one, it's completely different uh, pathology. And if it is a meningioma of the cavernous sinus, it also grows from one point and extends in a certain way that is so predictable. And if you know where the origin and where these tumors spread, then you have a plan of dissection. In, and what happened in the 1990s after Vinco Dolling introduced cavernous sinus surgery, it became popular and by so-called uh, skull-based surgeons, and there has been a resurgence of skull-based surgery and so forth. And at that time, a lot of people who I think they were ill-prepared and didn't understand operating in the cavernous sinus, jumped into the cavernous sinus prematurely, ended up with a lot of problems, and then changed the narrative. And they started saying, this is not worth it. And at the same time, radio surgery was showing up. So it was a perfect storm to kill microsurgery in the cavernous sinus, which you can say, well, in the majority of patients, we can give radiation, it works well and so forth. But what, what do you do with the 15, 20% of patients that have tumors that keep growing? And then they come to your, to your clinic 
they have massive tumors. Some of them have changed and we are knowing or understanding more and more now that meningiomas are not always these kind of uh, uh, benign lambs, but some of them are wolves, which look like lambs, but they will behave like wolves over time. And if you give radiation, you can even stir them up to grow faster. And in those cases, what do you do with them? And there is many of those cases that come my way. If you come to my clinic, you'll see them. So understanding anatomy leads to understanding the pathology because the in-depth knowledge of the anatomy is what helps you know how a tumor grown because you know the original location of a nerve and how it gets distorted. And this leads to the higher level of understanding the physiology of what's happening, just like Professor Yazagil so was able to see that, uh, that the uh, uh, gliomas are really expansile and not infiltrating based on that. So I'll start with the cavernous sinus meningiomas, the story that everybody kind of says, well, they are inoperable. They, they have been inoperable, this is true, but now they're not. And if you know enough, you should be able to, uh, to uh, tackle them safely. <clears throat> and uh, the real origin of this tumor is in this spot, which is in the corner under the third nerve and the fourth nerve, behind where the carotid is in its posterior genu as it transitions from the ascending to the intracavernous horizontal portion. That's exactly where this lesion is that uh, they start. Now, how do we know that? Because when they're small, they are in that location. And that's then when they spread, they spread into different spots. Some of them go anteriorly towards the cella. Some will go laterally and go around the carotid. Some will go towards Meckel's cave, posteriorly towards the petroclaval junction, either laterally or medially and then most medial into the pit, the, pit, the, the clivus and the, the dorsum cellular region. To what extent they grow in different directions it varies in different patients, but they have a pattern that you can see. So the knowledge that we have now on the cavernous sinus has been wrong. This is a publication about evolution and treatment of cavernous sinus meningiomas and uh, they, in this case, you see there is a picture which is wrong. First, this is not the cavernous sinus meningioma. You shouldn't even include it in the article. And this one is a completely wrong picture. What is wrong with all this is this is an article that was reviewed by reviewers and accepted to be published. Neither the, the person who wrote it had accurate information nor those who reviewed it recognized that, you know, there is something wrong here. If this article came to me, I will say, I'm sorry, this is completely wrong. You, you're not qualified to talk about the cavernous sinus. There's something missing here. So that led to this outcomes in patients. This is many of the patients I see, patients has tumor everywhere. This has been going on for years, more than 10 years. They've been partially removed, radiated, then given conventional radiation, and it's given gamma knife, then given proton beam therapy, and the story never finishes. And eventually, they get to where, okay, well, there's this crazy guy in, in Little Rock who operates on those. Maybe they can help you with it. Then they come to me. By the time I see them, unfortunately, you can see the tumor is in the orbit. It's infiltrating. And at the same time, the patient is blind. The morbidity is established, and there's not much you can you can do to improve it. But you can improve on the survival by removing the tumor, and we're able to clean it very well, like you can see. But the 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 outcome is decided. But at least in this case, we will stop them from dying from this disease in a way. Um, and this there's many stories I can show you. But what happens is there has been a lot of incomplete jobs and uh, people will venture, will take chances, will try. You, you don't wanna try 
spy on any person. You want to be sure what you're doing. And before that, you just go and learn it. Now, if, 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 it, if you are the pioneer of something, that's the only time you're qualified to try. But not if there is already something established that you can go learn. If you're going to jump and operate the aneurysms, and then you have someone like you, Ernest Naimi, that you can go watch do an aneurysm, which is the result of several thousand aneurysms, you're going to learn a hundred times more by watching one case instead of trying one case. And that exchange has to be established in a way. So did we have failures in the cavernous sinus? Yes, but failure is not the opposite of success. We, we use it for success. We use it, why did we fail? The problem that happened before is, is some people went to the cavernous sinus, they failed, they went again. They said, maybe I know better and I'll try again. Well, that's, that's fair. But if you wanna go in there and you do the same thing, it's not gonna work. It's like if you have a car that stopped in the middle of the road and you get out and push it and you cannot push it and you keep pushing, you're gonna hurt yourself. And nothing is gonna happen. You have to find another way of, of overcoming the difficulty. So you have to change your thinking of what is it that we're dealing with. You know, it's like if, you, if you're attacking a big um, challenge, you need to understand it. You need to understand your enemy before you attack it in a way. So that's where it led to, to analyzing what we're seeing. This is the, the, the region of the cavernous sinus. And these tumors start in the location just under the fourth nerve. And this is where it is, behind the sixth nerve, under the fourth and third in that corner. It's really close to the beginning of Dorello's canal. And when they grow, they grow in the different directions. They go into Meckel's cave, they go around the carotid, they go towards the cella, they go to the posterior uh, petroclival junction. They've been wrongly named different names. So look here, this is where the tumor is located. And when the tumor grows, it extends further into the, uh, this, kind of pocket filling the cavernous sinus, and that's how it looks then. And they extend along the tentorium. And this corner is covered by the tentorium within the cavernous sinus. And when they grow further, they go more into Meckel's cave. They start bulging out, and they push the V1, V2, V3 laterally, which is what happens here. And instead of the picture that you've seen wrongly showing that it is infiltrating around them or invading around them. That's wrong. And then you start going through the dura back here into the petroclival junction. And they have a very predictable growth pattern. You can really read it in front of you. And you can see it extending along the tentorium posteriorly. And that's why I call them cavernotentorial meningiomas. You see when they get bigger, they go to the cella laterally posteriorly, and now they, they have a confluence of it. They can go into the sphenoid sinus. This is why they were called sphenopetroclival meningiomas. They're, they're really cavernotentorial meningiomas extending laterally. So how to operate on them? Like every tumor, we have to reverse the growth pattern. You have to implode the tumor. And the surgery is not done on the tumor. It's done on the nerves because you need to dissect the nerves and then get them out, then the tumor becomes easy to remove in between. You have to delineate the carotid, find the nerves, and that's it. So now, how to dissect nerves? It's very simple. It's like dissecting nerves in the coda equina or in the region of the peripheral nerves. When you have a tumor in a nerve, what you do is you find the normal end of the nerve, you find the other normal end, you dissect the nerve towards the tumor. Once you find the tumor, you start debulking and dissecting the nerve, then you pull the nerve away, and then you finish removing the tumor. Same concept, which we have done, we just have to translate it to the cavernous sinus. And that's 
the way you can safely remove them instead of waiting until you get massive tumors operated on many times. You can see the only thing missing here is the temporal lobe, unfortunately, after this lady was told, go home and die with a tumor that's growing. So in that case, our knowledge of the cavernous sinus leads to the simplicity of handling the cavernous sinus. It is when we don't know, things look complex and difficult. But once we have the right knowledge, it becomes more simple. But this applies to everything. Aneurysm surgery is the same. Aneurysm surgery is all about knowledge of the anatomy of the aneurysm and exposure. If you achieve both, you conquer the aneurysm. The rest of it is your psychic preparation. You have to be comfortable that you can attack the aneurysm and not scared from the aneurysm. And that's it. And so an example like this, this tumor, small, filling this area in a patient who presented with a sixth nerve palsy. So I'm showing you the lab dissection because cavernous sinus surgery is like working in the laboratory. It's really a, a simulation of the lab work once you know the anatomy well. I start with coagulating and cutting the middle meningeal artery because it's a tethering point that prevents the dissection backward. This is where the middle meningeal artery is. If you don't cut it, you cannot come back to this level. So when you look here, I can see clearly in my eyes. Some of you may look at it, that it doesn't mean anything. I can see V1 is here, fourth nerve is here, third nerve, this is the clinoid, V2, V3, this is where the superficial petrosal nerve, and this is Petrus apex, Meckel's cave. You can already see the tumor, and I can see a bulging pushing the tumor laterally. I could see all this because I trained my eye, and I can see all this anatomy, and that's what I meant by you have to use your brain eye to be able to see it. Now we remove the clinoid process. This is the optic nerve. Sometimes these tumors extend towards the supracellular region. The dissection starts by delineating the fourth nerve. And the fourth nerve should be sharply dissected. And the way you dissect around the nerve, it has to be tangential with sharp dissection along the longitudinal axis. You do not want to dissect this way, and you do not want to dissect bluntly that's how you injure those nerves. The fourth nerve is delineated all the way to its entry into the tumor in the tentorium. And then the next thing is, once you get clean up, in this case, a lot of the pathologies here, you find the fourth nerve, then you find it intradural. We just slit open subtemporal. You find the third nerve. The tumor is filling this space. And then the next thing is, to delineate the fourth nerve, get it out of the tumor. You can already see the tumor here around it. That's the third nerve, fourth nerve, and that's his tumor in the posterior cavernous sinus. And as we delineate it, we will go to the tumor that's going towards the, the Meckel's cave. And this is opening Meckel's cave, unroofing it. And the carotid is already delineated anteriorly. And once we get that, we're removing tumor from within the cave itself. The, and then at the same time, this is a delineation of the tumor. And then we're removing the petroclival part, which is under Meckel's cave towards the Petrus dura. And then you see the anatomy starts getting delineated in a way. This is the Gasserian ganglion here, fifth nerve. And this is a little more ball of tumor which penetrated from this corner into the Meckel's cave. And you can see the sixth nerve starts becoming delineated. And this is the sixth nerve, the carotid is here. And it's all a dissection process what I'm doing. That's that's really the whole cook of it. And then once we get this fourth, third, six is identified. And now the petroclival uh, junction, which is filled of tumor and mixed with bone, can be removed. 
either with the sonopet or with the ronger. And gradually this is followed inferiorly. And as you remove it, you can see the basilar artery becoming more clear. And again, if you notice, all what we did is dissected the uh, nerves and delineating them. And then you start seeing this picture where the fifth nerve, where the tumor was, sixth nerve coming over the carotid, carotid is coming this way, fourth nerve all the way, third nerve, carotid, optic nerve. The beauty of all this is I'm operating under the brain and you don't really see much of the brain. You see the basilar artery here, you see the brain stem, you see how great this approach to get to the anterior pons, the area difficult to see and so on. And in every case, I am able to see the whole anatomy and imagine how much you can also see for other pathologies, craniopharyngiomas approached in this way. This is the, the uh, fourth nerve, that's the third nerve on the opposite side. This is P1, this is a bifurcation. There's even the sixth nerve on the opposite side. You can see it, you can see fifth nerve on the opposite. So you can travel across the midline and be able to clean the tumor completely. So by the end of it, uh, these nerves are completely preserved. And this is, to me, it's if the nerve is functioning pre-op, I know I'm going to preserve it post -op. And when the tumor is bigger, nothing changes. The, the extent of the tumor is bigger. All what happens is you dissect the nerves, and then you cut a bigger piece of tumor between the nerves. In a small tumor, you cut a smaller piece. In a bigger tumor, you cut a bigger piece. The anatomy and the dissection are the same. So we're dissect starting with the middle meningeal artery, the same pattern of dissection. And then once you cut it, it will allow you to dissect posteriorly. And the majority of the work is done exterior. This is cutting the meningeal orbital artery, which is the best place to start the dissection process. And usually you cut it along a groove that comes between the temporal lobe and the orbit over the crinoid process, the lateral aspect. Now, once the plane is established, then you start the dissection. There are certain tricks for hemostasis. There are certain, uh, you know, details about the dissection process. I'm not gonna, you know, talk more maybe on another time. I'm planning to take one case, one meningioma case, and dissect it fully, like to, to go through every step in full details, but I wanted just to give the overall message on it. So this is a larger tumor, and the dissection in the lab looks exactly like the dissection in the uh, operating room except here you have a bulge where the tumor is bulging into that area. So the first part is to remove the tumor extradurally, that's the carotid, and then cleaning it, fourth nerve, third nerve, V1, and delineate where the carotid is. Sixth nerve is gonna be in this corner. And sixth nerve is the more challenging nerve to find. And it has a characteristic location. It's usually where the V1, meets the Cassirian ganglion. It is just underneath. It is looping around the ascending carotid and then anterior to the petroclival ligament. So you have three points. It creates like a triangle where you will know this is where it is. So you stay away from it and you keep the dissection posterior. Once you decompress, you come back to it and I'll elaborate later how you find the nerve in different ways. But once you finish the extradural work, then you need to look at the nerves intradurally because you don't want to cross from intradural to extradural without seeing the nerves. That's a mistake was what happened. You're chasing the nerve, going back, and then what do you end up with the nerves being injured? So once we open, there is usually tumor on the other side of the temporal dura, which is itself as part of the tentorium.
And so you see the tumor here, which is above the carotid, lateral to it, and it is distorting the third nerve, as we have seen in the cadaver dissection. And, and then all what we do here is we cut the, the tentorium from over the fourth nerve, going from extradural and finding the intradural part. In this case, it's very interesting the, the advantage of this uh, dissection method. And I'll show you in a second. The third nerve, for example, is distorted, but you don't appreciate how much distortion it has. So you have to be able to follow it in its deformed state. So in this case, this is third nerve and this is third nerve. How can third nerve be here and third nerve be here at the same time? So that third nerve is distorted this way, you see it coming this way and goes back. Now I know I'm cutting over it. I know exactly the course of third nerve. That's how I'm not gonna injure it because I found the normal here and I know the normal on the superior orbital fissure. And this is how you preserve it. This is how it was not preserved in the past. And then once the same result is always the case, when I'm finishing those cases, it's the same view, big tumor or small tumor, you're getting a wide window into the interpeduncular fossa, the prepontine region, the uh, petrochrival junction and so on. And you can see all the nerves, just like in the cadaver, you will see them in real life. The only challenge left really is uh, two things now. I used to say one thing, which is the carotid being uh, uh, replaced because we're able to clean these tumors like you see here. And in this case, this patient had no pre-op deficits and even post-op yeah, and while in the yeah. hospital, you can see this yeah. lady, for example, was you know, or didn't have no any significant vision. double vision. I'm asking her if she has double vision. She said, no, it's not the case that the, there are two challenges. One is how to, uh, to get the sixth nerve. And the sixth nerve now we know the best way to do it is you have to take the petrous apex bone because the nerve is draped very sharply. You can see tight around the carotid and then here. So if you try to dissect tumor in a very tight space and a very tense, uh, tight nerve, you're gonna end up with injury. So you have to decompress that bone and then you can free it to where you mobilize it away from the lateral wall of the carotid and then you find it in the, uh, next to the brainstem and then you follow it up. So now you can see the continuity. If I lift the, this is the fifth nerve uh, for demonstration purposes. If I lift it, you will see how the nerve then becomes redundant. And instead of being uh, uh, more uh, uh, tense in a way. This is an example, a case where it shows the different points of it. Same thing they present with these uh, deficits usually, and uh, this is the extradural work going subtemporal and pretemporal. Middle meningeal artery is coagulated and cut, and then you dissect the uh, uh, extradural part. This is the left side, this is the orbit. This is the meningeal orbital band, coagulate and cut it, and you have to cut it along the uh, lateral edge of the uh, clinoid process in order to establish the plane. Once you get the plane, then you start dissecting posteriorly towards Meckel's cave and beyond. For meningiomas, you have to go beyond because these are creeping along the tentorium posteriorly. Then you find GSPN and then all of a sudden, the, the whole anatomy is visualized. 
When you're doing this, you have to be careful how much retraction you put on the temporal lobe because you need to bring your microscope from a more anterior point so you can look backward and not push much the temporal lobe. And if there is a lot of tumor inside the dura, then you may be compressing it and you may injure the temporal lobe tip in a way. So in this case, if tumor went to the sphenoid sinus lateral recess, you can see the tumor here. And then we're delineating the internal carotid. This is V3, between V3 and V2, the carotid, just where the tumor extended posteriorly. And again, this anatomy to me is familiar. So like I said earlier, it's like Michelangelo said, he's carving through the marble to get the, um, the, the angel out. And that's, that's how it feels. I'm, I'm trying to get the anatomy back to where it belongs in a way. So this is decompressing, removing the clinoid. Now you can see this is second, the optic nerve, third nerve, V1, V2, and this is the apex of the cavernous sinus. And if you notice, I am relaxing and enjoying my dissection process, like what I do in the lab. Now, delineating the third nerve, cutting the ligament, which is the oculomotor carotid ligament. The third nerve has a constant location at the apex next to the clinoid. So that is always helpful. And it's constant in the brainstem, so you know the places where you can find it. Then in this case, I'm lifting the V3 where the carotid is, and this is GSPN. And then, you know, in case we need proximal control, and also to clean some tumor around it. And then to go back, you can see here the view of the carotid, and then to go back to the mechascale region. So then we go back to the fourth nerve, delineate fourth nerve, follow it until it enters the tentorium, and then you stop. You don't continue there because it dives into the tumor, you can injure it. Third nerve, you stop. And then the same with the others. You can remove part of the extradural part here in the, if it is involving the, the floor of the middle fossa. And then we open the dura. Why? It's time to find the other end of the normal nerves. You see how the tumor is compressing the temporal lobe? That's what I meant. You don't want to retract much so you could don't injure the temporal lobe. And then this tumor is devascularized. You can see it's dead now. You just cut it. And if you have a big tumor, you cut a big piece. If you have a small tumor, you cut a small piece. And then once you get it out of the way, then you look behind it in the perimesencephalic system. You can see the third nerve now going into the perimesencephalic system. This is the fourth nerve here behind the tumor. And then going through the tumor and then going anteriorly. So now all what it is is dissection of the nerve to go from, and once you remove the tumor, you see the nerve. So notice that the surgery is not on the tumor. The surgery is on the nerves. It is delineating the nerves. And then while you're doing this, you're removing tumor. It's like I am cleaning tumor away to see the nerve. I am not operating on the nerve, on the tumor, see the nerves. No, I'm cleaning the nerves. And while I'm cleaning, I have to remove tumor to see them. Now I'm looking at the carotid. And this is the petroclival junction. And you can see that anatomy is starting to get delineated, but now we have part which is filling the metal scale region. And this is between third nerve and the carotid, which is, this is the region of the pituitary gland where the tumor went here. And that's where it goes to the cavernous sinus region. So this is carotid, clinoid, supraclinoid, and then cleaning it from that region. The next is to clean metal scale, unroof it, because there's tumor that went from this corner into it. These are the nerves uncovered. And then once we clean them, 
because now I have fourth away, third away, and the nerve is here. This is just a large piece of tumor in between them behind the carotid. And you can see now the sixth nerve. And if you notice here, like I said before, this is V1, Michael's cave, and sixth nerve comes, it follows V1 and it leaves V1 around the ascending carotid, which you can see here. So anterior to the petroclavian ligament. And if you have this in mind, you know where to find the region of the nerve. Once you find the region of the nerve, then you spend a little longer time delineating the nerve. And then to dissect it more inferiorly, you have to take the bone so that the nerve becomes more, the, the petroclavial junction, so the nerve becomes easier to mobilize and to see it at the brainstem level, in a way. So now you see it at the brainstem level, after cleaning all this, as it comes up. And then this is the region of the, uh, the Rellus Canal. And you can see tumor at the petroclavial junction there. So the picture is becoming more clear now, like the other pictures. All this now becomes stuff to be removed without difficulty because you have delineated the nerves. You can see the sixth nerve. This is the Meckel's cave. And all of a sudden, once we get this piece out, you see the basilar artery, fourth nerve, third nerve, carotid, sixth nerve. And it's, it's the same picture that gets repeated every time when we finish the tumor at the end. And that's how you can see all clean. Still, there's a little sliver that's around the carotid that we will need to conquer over time. But this patient has a sixth nerve palsy right. and post-op, and you can see she already, her sixth nerve is working and the third was partial before, and that will recover fully. I know it will. The problem is when they have sixth nerve pre-op, which is significantly injured. This is a case where I had six nerve, uh, which was not complete, but significant. In this case, just to, to show you at the end, uh, three to four months later, she had full recovery. This is the uh, removal of the tumor, that's a big tumor. But since we've started doing this maneuver for six nerve, we're able to preserve them very well. And you, you know, the patients are many, they can see that recovery is full, whether they are, you know, basilar aneurysms or tumors. If you dissect those nerves carefully, they will recover. The oculomotor nerve has the highest rate of recovery. And I rarely have anybody who has a deficit. It's a larger tumor. And the way the tumor goes around it, I mean, it's a larger nerve. The way the tumor goes around it is easier to dissect even when they have deficits. The problem is with the abyssal nerve. In those who have significant pre-op deficits, there is uh, five of them with no recovery. And I'll show you later a case recently we did. I realized why, because these tumors are really invading into the nerve or damage the nerve because of the tight space in the Dorellus canal. And uh, the trochlear nerve has a better recovery. And actually, I have one patient where we preserved the nerve at the end, a cotinoid when we were peeling it off, it, it, uh, it cut the nerve. We put it back together. And on follow-up, uh, we, we glued it with fibrin glue. And on follow-up, the patient had full functions. I am not sure, should we take credit for it? And, and if that happens in the future, to use the same or uh, maybe the brain adjusted to the deficit over a long period of time. Um, and this is a, a big thing to me because we, we don't have any significant deficits in these patients. <clears throat> and I don't worry about it. I'm comfortable telling patients that they will not have new deficits. The likelihood that they will improve their deficit is extremely high, especially the third nerve. Sixth nerve, fortunately, you can correct it with, uh, if it doesn't recover with the uh, prism glasses and some corrective surgery. Now, this is a case which um, example of re cavernous sinus region lesions. 
it's, it's a schwannoma, which is, I have seen crazy uh, discussions about cases like this. Endoscopic approach, partial remover, followed by middle fossa or posterior fossa approach, uh, you know, one, two petrosal approaches, uh, just, you know, there's a whole slew of things. <clears throat> we have to always go to the origin of the tumor. <clears throat> this is a tumor which is centered in Meckel's cave and anterior and posterior to it. They can sometimes grow significantly in the middle fossa, then you don't have to chase them back. And sometimes they're very big here. But if you come on top of the tumor to see both ends, this is, makes sense to be the best way to approach them. That's why the, this approach will give you a panoramic view of the tumor. You already seen the tumor bulging here. This is the optic nerve carotid. This is all done exedurally first. This is fourth nerve delineated and it is pushed by the tumor. But when you find all these and this is dissecting them and getting them out of the way and looking at the tumor, both intra and exedural, that's a third nerve. And what I'm doing here, finding them, and that's the tumor in the posterior fossa, medial to the fourth nerve and inferior to it and lateral to it in going to Meckel's cave. This is the fourth nerve inside the tentorium being dissected. And then we will cut it and get it out of the way. And then I find the sixth nerve. That's a petroclival ligament. You see the location. <clears throat> this is the uh, V1. Gasserian ganglion is here. Tumor is here. This is the fifth nerve filled with tumor. And then there is tumor behind it in the brainstem. This is the petroclival ligament, and it drops down behind the carotid into the Dorello's canal down here. So next is to get this tentorium open over the tumor, which is all this area, because we already found where six nerve is, third and fourth. And then this is the nerve going from extradural to intradural. Once you cut this, you can see the whole course of the tumor, extradural and intradural. And then once you get this panoramic view, and you see this, the, this is tumor next to the brainstem, tumor in the Meckel's cave. And now you cut the tentorium and I am free to cut it because I did, took the fourth nerve. You see, the fourth nerve is already mobilized. So now I got this view. And now I can decide where to enter. And if you notice, this is all splayed. Anywhere you cut, you're going to cut nerve. But if you lift it to the side, then I don't cut any little fibers. I have seen a video on the internet. It is crazy. Uh, one of my fellows delineated it to me. Somebody was operating through some approach. I don't know what they call that approach. But he said, this is the nerve. Uh, this is not an important bundle of the nerve, so we can cut it. And he cut a big chunk of the nerve. This is how this tumor looks. And this is how it looks. So we followed it all the way from its extradural to intradural part. And by the time we finish, you know, you are cleaning the last bit of the tumor and then you have the whole nerve preserved and none of it is affected by your surgeon. The patient will have a completely intact. You can see the fifth nerve coming down. Everything is visualized and fourth nerve is here, third nerve is here. The anatomy is all displayed. And you had really a, <laughs> a surgery which is not related to the brain, if you think. And look at the acnoid is preserved around the liquid membrane, around the basilar. And that's the view you get. And the tumor is all gone. So, and that's how it looks post-op. It, it's really, but not acceptable. I have seen even someone approach this 
endo, uh, endoscopically and uh, with an injury to the carotid artery. Uh, I mean, this is too much. The, the adenomas are easier. I have many patients who are cured with secreting adenomas, like this case. And you just have to know that they arise from medial to lateral, and they push the anatomy in a certain way. You can claim this is a Cushing's patient. And this is a, a big plus. We all have patients like this. This is a patient who has Cushing's disease, who was operated on and still has a residual tumor. You can see the normal scan here. And the petrosa sinus sampling was positive on the left side. So we knew this patient had tumor before, that that must be that they have residual tumor there. But it's hiding in the cavernous sinus and going in, fishing for it without fully knowing exactly what you're exploring. And I know how they go in. They go around the carotid. This is the cavernous carotid, and they follow it towards Meckel's cave region. So in this case, I talked to the patient, and I said, look, I know where these tumors are hiding, because the MRI does not tell you much. It suggests maybe there is some filling in one part. So we delineated this, and you can see here the anatomy where we went for. This is the carotid, this is the clinoidal carotid, and the, tu the pituitary gland is gonna be here, and the tumor is here. It is extending in that corner where it's under the third nerve and posterior to the posterior genoa and on the medial side. This is the gland, the tumor extended from here Posteriorly, it's a corner which is not easy to see as clearly as we're seeing it here. And that's the, the beauty of this is all done extradurally predominantly. But knowing the growth pattern of this tumor has helped us cure this lady. This is a, an, in a surgery which is simple relatively that this patient will go home within a couple of days because this was done predominantly exodurally. And this to me is a breakthrough. This is a patient who would have gone on medications for a long time. Then you need to radiate, but you don't see tumor. Then you end up radiating a large area. It may or may not work. You end up damaging the pituitary gland from the radiation. And still these patients may not be cured. And in those cases, it, really, it's a, a major failure. And I think this is where microsurgery and understanding the anatomy and the anatomy of the pathology can give you a big reward in somebody who is young and have a, a much better quality of life and life expectancy at the same time. And this is where this tumor is hiding in this area. There's a pituitary gland and they kind of extend into this region. So the, these are, you see the view after we finish. It's all extra dural. And this is post-op immediately. And she have almost full function. And if you know how to dissect the nerves, there will be very little double vision for two to three weeks and they recover fully. But you give them a new life. You know, this lady already you know, within a month time, there's big changes. The, the other plus is using the cavernous sinus as a highway. This is a tumor, which is a, a glioma of the mammillary bodies. It's a posterior third nerve glioma, like a hypothalamic glioma. Uh, they are not easy to delineate, and if you see that, it is going into the prepontine system. Because I have done these surgeries on the cavernous sinus, and when I do the exposure, I find out when I finish, I'm looking at the whole basilar and interpeduncular fossa and the mammillary bodies in front of my eyes. So I thought, well, this is really the way to go to them. You just do the whole surgery extradurally. So you see the dissection, and in this case, I delineate the fourth nerve, find the sixth nerve, 
and just open the space. This is third nerve. We open the sylvian tissue. Now, the fourth nerve is mobilized with the third nerve to unlock all this petroclival uh, dura. And once you get this open, then look at the perforators that are out of the way for the posterior communicating. This is the optic nerve. And the tumor, you can see it here. This is A1. This is further opening Meckel's cave. You see all this has to be open. This is going to the posterior fossa. This is fourth nerve, third nerve. And now we take the petroclival dura. And you will be looking straight at the tumor, which is covering the upper basilar region. And look at this view now fourth nerve, the tumor is on the surface. It became a surface tumor. It was a very deep tumor. And now you just take your time debulking it. This was a pilocytic astrocytoma. This is a curable tumor. In a young person, she's in her 30s, late 20s and also. And then I'm following it down, putting the petroclaval junction so we can see the prefontine part of the tumor. By the time we finish, you can see the basilisk here. And the tumor is all clean from in front of it. And we have dealt with no perfect, beautiful view of the whole interpeduncular fossa and operating under the bone. And the post stop, you can see how it looks. All this going down to here. So this is the view that, that stimulate us to, to do all this. Let me pass one more. Cordoma is the same in the cavernous sinus. They're more fun to me because they're softer usually, unless some chondrosarcomas which are calcified. Again, if they are medial, they behave like pituitary tumors because they grow and push the nerves laterally. And knowing this helps you with how they distort the carotid and how to operate on them. This is usually where they grow from, and that's how they distort the anatomy. So knowing this, you should know how to approach them and in what windows. Right? These cases, post-op, and this is a case actually, you can see the tumor here. This can be approached endoscopically, but the problem is this tumor involves all this region and that bone is usually involved. So in these cases, doing a full transcavernous approach gets you down to that region. And if you look at the approach, we do the same thing, extra dural, and then mobilize the fourth nerve and third nerve like we did earlier, fourth nerve, Open the tentorium. Open Meckel's cave. And then you unlock all this petroclival region, like you're seeing it in the lab. And now it's open to the posterior fossa. This is the carotid and the cavernous sinus. posterior genu, and then by the time you open all this, you are looking at the tumor, and we remove the bone here, which is involved with tumor, and the tumor resection becomes a quick, easy step. The only thing left here to watch for is the fifth, sixth nerve, because it comes this way, down this way. And But you can see the extension laterally and in the pre region and you're working under the brain structures, and you have a white space, you're not worried about it. But the beauty of it, the advantage is, you're trying to cure these patients. 
we know now, this is the sixth nerve, you see that? And delineating it coming up. And then the removal of the tumor becomes like a surface surgeon. It's not deep surgeon anymore. So this highway you can use, and this is the advantage here. You can chase little details of the tumor so that by the time you finish, you don't leave any piece of tumor on the bone or on the dura. That's a sixth nerve on the opposite side. That's the basilar artery. It's third nerve on the opposite side. And again, the, all the surgery is done under the temporary lobe. Mm. So this is a case which had something new, I am putting it. This is a patient who had a six nerve palsy, complete six nerve palsy. When we operated on it, this is a case which had a, um, a tumor that was uh, involving, this is the steps of it, like you see, fourth nerve, delineating the nerves, cleaning the part which is extradural first. And what's interesting is this is Meckel's cave, cleaning Meckel's cave. Now here, you notice six nerve had two bundles and six nerve has two bundles. It's a fourth nerve, this is carotid. In this case, the tumor was very matted around the carotid itself. This is six nerve. And when we got to, to the deeper point, we realized that it was very uh, involved with tumor. By the time we cleaned the tumor, the integrity was completely gone. And, and that's why this patient had a, a, a complete six nerve preoperative. But this is the process again, extradural fourth, interdural fourth, and then we are bringing them together. And you can see now the next is to remove the tumor. And we open the dura further. This is the part which is in the middle fossa. And then once you get it out, you start cleaning the petroclival junction, just removing a larger piece of tumor. Fourth nerve, third nerve, carotid is here. Sixth nerve, you can see it coming down. Fifth nerve is pushed basilar, pushed laterally. This is the empty Meckel scale where tumor was. So notice here, sixth nerve coming down, it meets here, goes to the relis canal. At this point, by the time we cut tumor, the integrity of it was completely uh, gone in a way. And that's, you can tell why this patient has a complete sixth nerve. If you remember from my previous slide, Six nerve are the most difficult to recover if they are complete. And I think because they're already completely damaged. So what we did in this case, we did something different. We took uh, part of it. This is the petroclival junction being removed. You'll see what we did. Um, what I did is I took this cable of six nerve and cut it, then took this cable which is coming, looks healthy, and then went down to the brainstem and cleaned the petroclaval junction, found the sixth nerve where it was de uh, uh, completely demolished here. Then we took this and used it as a cable graph. So you use the same type of nerve for the, uh, uh, the repair of it. So um, at this case, we took You'll see it in a second. These are still the two pieces coming down after we cleaned. But this is the area where it was completely kind of disrupted. So by the end,
this is what we did. We took the sixth nerve and bridged it down to here, all the way. This is the post-op on the patient. You can see pre-op, post-op, and there's a sliver only around the carotid lip. And in this case, we will see on follow-up if the sixth nerve recovers. Third nerve, I know will recover. She has significant third nerve pain. So th there is a lot that can be done in microsurgery for tumors in the cavernous sinus. In the same way, that a lot can be done for annuals. It's unfortunate that as the young lady that I mentioned earlier, who ended up with a deficit and uh, she had significant problems. So I'll go briefly over the aneurysm part. And those who are interested tomorrow, I'll be talking in more detail with Professor Yazagil about basilar aneurysms. But this is a, an aneurysm which has really been uh, overcome more by this, this approach. These aneurysms tend to come back. They fail more frequently with endovascular therapy because of how dysmorphic they are. And, you know, when should we use surgery and why we're not using surgery? It is a superior option, like Evandro used to say, when you're doing it at the superior level. Because keep in mind, a perfectly clipped aneurysm leads to a perfect result. A perfectly endovascularly treated aneurysm is not always leading to a perfect result. Like that lady I presented, she bled, although the picture looked perfect, but she died because of the massive bleed during the coiling. There are patients who have bad aneurysms that if you clip them, you can reconstruct the neck, but if you treat them endovascularly, they recur. So what we should aspire really is to a higher level of outcome, not accept a lower level of outcome. And we're accepting it. We are lowering the bar. We are accepting less than what we can do as neurosurgeons. This is an example, this case. I, there's no way I would agree that this case should be treated other than microsurgeon. And the way we approach them is similar to what you have seen, but less involved than the tumors. And it's a just dissection of normal anatomy. It's a Terrional approach, but more temporal in a way, and pre-temporal in the exposure. And then you delineate the middle fossa, and you have to unlock this region. To what extent you will dissect depends on the aneurysm. Some aneurysms, you have to unlock all this if they are very low, or if it's involving the basilar trunk. Some, <clears throat> you have to go higher. You don't need to dissect except maybe the third nerve. So when you have a crowded field, which is narrow, in the advantage here, you delineated the third nerve from the brainstem to the orbital fissure, which makes it more likely to heal from any manipulation. And you widen the space further if need be, like in this case, the basilar trunk is not seen. So you need to remove the posterior clinoid. And once you remove posterior clinoid, the tumor is covered by a short segment of a PECOM. This is a perforator free zone in a PECOM. And look at the view you get when you have a clip on the basilar, clip on the P1. There's no need for a clip here, you can. And you have a full view. Why should I treat this other than this way, which would result in a perfect outcome and long term cure for this aneurysm? I, I don't see. Why not? Now, people are scared from doing surgery. They're scared from the word basilar aneurysm. And I will make more of a bold statement. If you're scared from a certain surgery, then you are doing scary surgery for that thing. If I'm scared from an aneurysm, then I am doing scary surgery for the aneurysm. It's very simple. You cannot in any way tell me that there is anything that can treat an MCA aneurysm better than you are Ernest Namey 
treating it within an hour period of time and curing the aneurysm. There is no way. There is no way to come and put web device and, and stent and coils and a bunch of things when you can go in and out within an hour time and finish the job and cure it with an, an extremely low morbidity and, and, and zero mortality. I, I don't see why we are not uh, uh, kind of logically looking into it in this way. It is wrong. And I know why. It goes back to how I started my lecture. It is the popular. The popular has a lot of pressure and it forces people to conform. And people are conforming but some patients are paying the price. And I don't want, if, if my daughter has an MC aneurysm, no way on earth it will be touched except by a competent surgeon. I'm telling you, the idea of that doing a craniotomy is scary, that's nonsense, you know? If your craniotomy is scary, then it's your problem, you have to improve on it. This case, for example, after we expose it, and I'll speed it up some, same pictures that I showed, but this is the process of dissecting the nerve. And the reason to dissect the third nerve is this will allow it to become more redundant and easy to retract. Then you can, um, then it is no, no more traumatized. So you see here, we remove the posterior clinoid. See how the nerve moves and it recovers fully. I've shown you the videos earlier of the cases. And now we cut this and now you have a nice highway that takes you to the basal or trunk. Then removing, cutting the posterior clinoid, I mean the posterior communicating artery. And then, then gradually you see the view, you see move the third nerve a little bit and look at the view of the aneurysm. You can see the perforators, you're moving around it, this posterior to the P1. the clips, and then just like showed you in the picture, see, you can see the perforators, the neck and everything, so you can put the perfect clip. And so why should I not have this kind of surgery, which is very safe, and if anything happens, you know, you see, I'm, you can dissect, you can do a perfect clipping. If I'm, I'm always making sure before I go home that I have dissected everything and I see everything, nothing is, is, is a, attached to the aneurysm. Nothing has been included as part of the aneurysm. You see, I'm putting a clip again. After I dissected the perforators, I'm coming back to see the neck better and in order to put it. And you see what I said earlier, you shouldn't be scared from an aneurysm. The aneurysm should be scared from you. And if you have this attitude, you have the right exposure, good knowledge of anatomy, why should we not get a perfect result? It, it's inexcusable, you know, inexcusable. This is the view you get in every case, and that's the outcome. On the contrary, this is a case one of my fellows sent me, Ruben from Holland. What to do about it? 35 years old, coiled more than once. If you look at the original picture, I cannot accept that this case should not be surgically clipped by the right person. So what we need is we need more good surgery, not more endovascular options. Because they're even, you know, if you look at the, at the review of the literature, it is clear that complete occlusion is a higher chance with microsurgery, but it's very sad that it's called the most morbid treatment. That's nonsense. And it has less re-hemorrhage and retreatment rate. So we know something works better. We just have to do it better. And that's it. Otherwise, this is what we're going to end up with, catastrophes like this, coiled, big stroke in the brainstem, and so on. And you have publications after publication about 
endovascular failure, none of those will mention surgery as an option. It's, uh, it's kind of mind boggling. Going back to Michelangelo, you know, we have lowered the bar of our expectations for vascular surgery. And we are achieving our goal, yes. You know, if we want to achieve, like the most recent paper of the web device, 52% only complete occlusion. Yuha knows and I know if any one of us says, I only completely clip aneurysms 52% of the times and 48% of the time I leave residual aneurysm. What's gonna happen to us? We're gonna be hanged as bad surgeons, but it's acceptable by the popular that it's another option should be sub, it's okay. So I'm not gonna accept anything less than this for my patients or this, or this, or this, and so on. This is a case I was like three weeks ago. This is a case to me, I, when I see something like that, it's a surgical case. And if you see when we get the exposure, it's all extradural work and then this is the view you get. Basilar artery, P2, this is a very high riding one. We didn't have to remove the posterior clinoid. We cutting the posterior communicating artery. And then gradually you look up, you change the direction of the microscope, and then you're visualizing the leg. You see how high it is. And the advantage here, when we put a clip, the, the aneurysm and the whole uh, system deflates. So this is a perforator-free zone. You see the perforators, this is superior cerebellar. We put the clip here so that blood can come to the perforators from inferiorly and the superior perforators get blood from the superior cerebellar system after you put the other clip on P1. And now we change the angle of the scope and then you will be looking up towards the aneurysm. Now the aneurysm is deflated and the whole complex came down because you deflated it and then you can put your clip under full vision. And by the time I finish, there was a small aneurysm here. By the time we sit, we finish, you can see we can, we can see the whole complex, and everything is done under the brain, and it's completely clipped. Giant, large, uh, ruptured aneurysm. Again, the advantage of this approach, you don't have to deal with a, even if it's high riding or a difficult brain. Why? Because you're operating under the brain. And what happens here, again, I'll skip it so you can see the view you get. This is third nerve, basal artery. This is the anterior and posterior too. And then by the time we finish clipping it and you are manipulating and then putting the pilot clip deflate, now we converted the aneurysm from a large unruptured ruptured aneurysm to a small unruptured aneurysm using the Yazergill technique of bipolar and coagulating it. And now I can put my perfect clip looking at the perforator and making sure nothing is included. By the time we finish, you can see around it, you can see 360 degrees and the aneurysm is completely obliterated. Much more difficult posteriorly projecting aneurysm. In this case, same. I'll skip the approach. You can see all the work extradural, opening the fissure. Sorry.
And then you can see here, this is third nerve, the aneurysm projecting inside the interpeduncular fossa. Now we put the clip on the opposite pecan, and then its lateral pecan, because this was a large pecan, you see it, it's a um, fetal pecan. We cannot cut it. And on the basilic, and now you can see the aneurysm. This is P1, basilar down here, opposite P1. And now we deflate the aneurysm and we are looking posteriorly into the interpeduncular fossa. Look around, find the perforators, and then put a clip. Under full vision, 360 degrees, you have no blind spot. You see, I put a piece of cotton here to push the perforators away. And then we deflate it. And look around and it's, again, the view when we finish. All done under the bed. Large aneurysms, the same. And I will try to wrap it out for the sake of time. And this is a giant aneurysm. This one needs certain maneuver, but you can only do them because of the approach. This is the view you get. I'm looking behind the P1 because this is a large bulbous aneurysm. Again, those are not easy to do. You know, you has cases that he has done with a subtemporal approach, but because he's operating mostly in his brain, you know, he's able to see more, but if you are, don't have his experience, you want to be safe, if you use this approach, you can see more directly. And that's why the advantage of this approach over time is it will allow more people to do it safely. And now we put the clips and then you are able to see better in all angles. And I'll speed it up. This is opposite P1, P1, and then the neck becomes soft and we can put the clip. What we do in these cases is the following. I compress, you see the aneurysm is very big. So I compress the aneurysm to bring it down so the neck becomes smaller, but I may include P1 in it first, and then slip a clip and then remove it so that by the time we finish, you have this view and the aneurysm is perfectly clipped. You see it's going around. Very low aneurysms like this, they need to be like we have done for the other tumor, which was low. This is where the hypothalamic lesion was. So it's the same approach. We opened the tentorium and mobilized the fourth nerve. See, fourth nerve. And make sure you see where the six, so we can cut the petroclival dura. This is the petroclival dura being cut. And then the aneurysm becomes on the surface. See that? Then the clipping part becomes the easy part because you are very close to the aneurysm. They're not common like this. I have about four or five cases that are that low that you do this approach and makes it very easy, especially when, when the, the biggest plus in this case is, is you really do the surgery under the brain fully. You don't, you don't, uh, uh, have to see the brain much in a way. We deflate the aneurysm, look around, make sure the perforators are all not included, nothing. You can have full 360 degrees view. And again, the big plus is this view. You're working under the brain. So we're close to 290 cases now. The outcomes are really good because 
even in ruptured ones, because you don't injure the brain at all, you're working under it, 83% end up in three months to one year in very good independent state. And with the unruptured one, 95%, 92 are zero to one on the ranking scale. And there are three unclippable, two of which were coiled three previously. And regrowth occurred in three patients compared to endovascular is extremely low. And one of them had a very dysmorphic base and disease even after endovascular treatment has grown. Two of them we reclipped. Oculomotor palsy is the recovery is the rule usually if you dissect them the way we do. Uh, <clears throat> one thing is, you know, I'm not going to go this, but paraclinoid aneurysms, and we have a large experience with those aneurysms, are, are the, also a part of the cavernous sinus pathology to me. And they're very easy to treat once you get uh, the clinoid removed and cleaned. So I'm just going to show one example of this. This is the, the area to be cleaned, and it's all centered around the clinoid, understanding of the clinoid process, its attachments, and what it relates to. So when you dissect these aneurysms, you have a full view of this region. And again, we do these cases completely extradural in a way. So this is an example. We do just a partial pretemporal exposure along the superior fissure to, to get the uh, to get exposed the, the clinoid. And once we remove the clinoid, we do it exedurally and expose the carotid, get proximal control. Then when you look at opening the dura, I open the dura very little, just in the subtemporal region and a little bit over the optic nerve and then cut clean this dura, which is based over the dura ring. And then you are able to see the aneurysm very clearly. You can see that once you open the, the dura of the pulsiform ligament, uh, these aneurysms are so easy to, this hiding on the medial side of the optic nerve. And it, this patient presented with visual symptoms. Look at how much it's pushing into it. This is the ophthalmic artery. And then the view, you get a very small opening in the dura. And then you just put your clip and uh, it's uh, very non-traumatic. So to be told that this is a case that should be treated with a stent where you will change the hemodynamics of a major artery to the brain and put the patient on antiplatelet therapy with the risk it may take and limiting their activity, I am not sure this is the correct answer. This is cured completely and decompress the nerve as well. When they are bigger, it's, it's not a big deal. It's the same surgery. The whole surgery is done in this case, also under the brain. And it's all exposure. And once you get the exposure, you clean it. And then we get proximal control in the, in the uh, clinodal carotid. This is on A1. You can see the aneurysm. And then the clipping part becomes the easy part because you just have to coagulate the aneurysm and make it smaller and put your clip around it and then take your time finalizing the clipping process. Mm -hmm. And this is all under full view. So I'll skip this. This is the post op. And an example also, this is buried inside the climate. We can expose proximal control. In this case, you can do it in the neck. But with what we do, it's very easy for me to do it in the cavernous sinus. So what we do here, this is, I'm already exposing this region. This is a step that takes me extra 10 minutes. This is the horizontal carotid. 
Now I have it exposed because I'm worried when I'm drilling, the, an the aneurysm is inside the clinoid. This is part of the aneurysm here. This is the third nerve. I'm cleaning around it. This is clinoidal carotid and the super and the cavernous carotid is here. See, this is part of the aneurysm here. I'm cleaning, but it's really dissection of the aneurysm I'm preparing. It. So now you have the cavernous, clinoidal, exposed, ready for a flip, and the opening is the same. Very small opening. And now once we clean the dura, you will see now how easy to clip the aneurysm. You can see the aneurysm now here. You see, all this was part of the clinoid covered with aneurysm. I mean, part of the aneurysm covered by clinoid. This is removed, cleaning the clinoid. And this difficult type aneurysm, look how easy to clip. Why? Because we did the right exposure. Again, aneurysm surgery is exposure surgery and knowing anatomy. So why, if I can cure this, accept any other treatment when I barely saw the brain? This is the clip on the clino and the carotid in the cavernous sinus to soften it, to put the perfect clip around it. I have a perfect view and full control. I don't have to open the neck. You can open the neck if you're not comfortable with this, but you should become comfortable. The cavernous sinus should be the area where everybody should be able to operate. I will skip this. I will show you one thing. This is a, a let me just go. Even these cases, this patient has three aneurysm. Basilar, here, you can see it, and AOACOM, and had also a giant uh, intracavernous. We knew we were going to treat those, and patient already has a third nerve palsy. In, in our case, we, this is to me, can, it's possible to clip. You can, because it has a good neck, you can see it. So we open, this is the fourth nerve and third nerve being dissected. And you have to know the planes. You see, I know the planes, how to dissect the animals. But I already have, in this case, I did proximal control in the neck. And this is the aneurysm in the cavernous sinus going up to this region. This lady was losing vision already also. The reason is she, the aneurysm compressed her, uh, compressed her ophthalmic artery. So this is distal control on the supraclinoid segment. We've already put on the infra in the neck region. This is where it was compressing the op op ophthalmic artery. So now this is aneurysm, you see that? Filling this area. I'm freeing the neck and freeing the aneurysm, getting a clip closer to the ophthalmic, proximal to it. And now I will deflate the aneurysm. I took the one distal, so blood goes back to the ophthalmic. And then I deflate the aneurysm. And then just reconstruct it with clip. I will find the proximal carotid here. See, that's the carotid proximal. Now I put the clip here and remove it from the neck. Now I have full control in my hand. And then this is the aneurysm collapsed. And I will just reconstruct it. You know, that's the aneurysm deflated. And I will show you exactly, you know, it's not easy to understand it. We put the first clips around it. And this is the final view you'll see. It. So what we did here is we, this is the aneurysm. 
the aneurysm comes from here to here. So the neck is wide, this is the neck. So what we did is we put two clips, one clip and another clip. And that's how you see it. You see the two clips reconstructing the, the artery completely. So we cannot underestimate what we can do. So to conclude, I think I, I would like to remember in Andrews, uh, you know, if you look what Professor Hanasini is doing, what's driving him, there is a certain passion. And we have to have that passion. And that comes from the need to have patience and to do something at the highest level. You need to be determined, which means you have to put the effort and work hard and to be courageous, but not in a reckless way and to be prepared and have a right inner sense to perform it. These are my teachers that I learned a lot from, from the cavernous sinus. And we all are under the same umbrella, Professor Yazagi's umbrella. It's a picture I like to show of Evandro when we were in Taiwan. And take as much as you can from your teachers and give them credit. And, and I hope everybody will give Evandro a lot of good wishes and prayers for what he's going through. But microsurgery is a must. It is needed because patients need it. And it has unlimited potential because of what we can do. And to master it is when you change things which look complex like the cavernous sinus. And I hope I relate the, the message to become simple. And this is an example, somebody who has done this picture. And when you look how long it took him, five minutes on the TV. Why? Because he made the complex simple. He knew how to do it perfectly well. And this picture will take me five to six days if I can get close to it. Nothing is impossible. I learned this from all my teachers. And it is not, it doesn't mean after my lecture, go and start operating on the cavernous science. You should know your limits but you should have the attitude that you should have no limits. And the last thing is what Professor Yezagil said in the last WFNS, great words, judicious courage, which means don't be reckless, use good judgment, but be courageous, try something new if it can help a patient. But do it based on professional competence, which means you are well-trained, you're well-prepared. So there is a lot of people coming through the pipeline of microsurgery. Thanks to a lot of people who have stayed the course, like Yuha, who's went to China, then give up and still teaching to push the message. This is our home. We welcome you all. We were hoping to have an international meeting with a life surgery course for a microneurosurgery community we are establishing but we could not because of COVID, we're, we're looking into either next year or the year to follow to, to come to our home and see how much people are eager to learn microsurgery. This is the last cavernous sinus course we had. It was packed. So it is not gonna go away because patient needed and because there's a lot that can be done. So thank you very much for the opportunity, Yoha, and thank you, for Zubin, for all the work. And uh, uh, I hope this was uh, a message that kind of continues, especially in China, what Yoha has been doing, uh, beautiful work. And, and uh, I was in China and I operated in his hospital about a year and a half ago, and I could already see his impact. And I, I can imagine how it is now. And uh, good to see all of you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Ali. Thank you. Go ahead, you Thank you, Ali, very much. Thank you, Ali, very much for excellent lecture, as, as always. Uh, there are some questions.
written in the chat, but is there someone who wants to ask directly? Comment, questions? Uh, let's see here. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, um, Dr. Ani, thank you um, very much for this um, invaluable lecture. Actually, it's really uh, something that we should repeat and go over and over again to at least be close to master it. Um, I have simple questions, actually. I was uh, wanting to ask Dr. Yuha also. So, well, um, for the aneurysms, I saw that most of the time you get a sample for it and send for histopathology. So my question, when you exactly um, puncture it only or you always cut it and send for histopathology or it depends on the location or the surgery or the, um, the whole picture of the, um, of the aneurysm? I hope you get my question. I think you can answer this because he's done a lot of research on the aneurysms. Yeah, the, to cut the aneurysm dome, it is, uh, we made it for basic research to have to study the aneurysm wall. So it is, of course, not necessary to do okay. that. If you have a small aneurysm, you should not do, of course, because there's so little mm -hmm. substance. But I think at the moment in Helsinki, they have now 700 aneurysm specimens they can during the operation. This is only research. It's only research. Uh, so right you, as, you, as you saw, so Ali and uh, Professor Asakil and me, we are many times coagulating the aneurysm and opening the aneurysm or puncturing the aneurysm. These are always only, only to be sure that the whole aneurysm is secured or to make the base smaller. But uh, of course, you can just put the clip. Like many neurosurgeons are doing, they just put the clip. But this is not good. You should work on it and uh, many times apply the clip so that it's in perfect position. So you should not, not be happy with the first clip application. So, like Ali is always saying, it is a process. Clipping is a process, not just to put the clip on. Okay, so and and you decide to cut it and, and send for histopathology, like an individual case, like case by case, or there is specific criteria where you decide, okay, so we're gonna cut this aneurysm and send for histopathology. So yeah, it should have uh, uh, some size. It should have some size so that that you can cut it safely. It is for research. It is not uh, helping the patient at the moment in any way. So it's only for basic research and several PhD has have been done in Helsinki on the aneurysm wall. Okay. The, the, the basin is not benefiting if you cut the specimen from the base. There are a few times where there is help in cutting it. For example, yeah, on giant, have, you know, yeah, yes. Yeah. Giant aneurysm, sometimes you have an artery draped on the dome, which is hindering you from doing a perfect clipping. So you put the first clip, like you have said, uh, you put a first pilot clip, you collapse the aneurysm, you cut part of the aneurysm with the artery attached to it. So now you have a free aneurysm, then you can reconstruct it perfectly. So this is when it is needed to be cut. But usually, like he said, the cutting is only when you can cut it, do you have substance of it for research? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invaluable lecture, actually. And because sure. vascular is my, my big interest. Sure. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You're from Jordan, correct, for that? Yeah, yeah, Dr. Joan, I'm from Jordan. Okay, okay. more comments, questions? There's one from the panel, uh, Dr. Christ. Um, do you use a lumbar drain before the exposure? Sometimes it is difficult to elevate the temporal dura from the outer cavernous sinus mm -hmm. otherwise. No, I actually never, never use the uh, lumbar drain. Uh, and you should be, the, the difficulty with elevating the dura from the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus comes from 
usually if you're in the wrong plane. Um, yes, there are some patients who have a little bit more difficult plane than others, but you need to have done this in the lab many times so you know how to get back to your plane. But usually I don't have to. Now, if the brain is very full and uh, I am dissecting, for example, for a basilar, the pretemporal space, then what I do is, uh, once I remove the clinoid, I make a small slit over the optic nerve and then go directly to the uh, uh, lamina terminalis and open it so spinal fluid will come and then the dura will relax. If need be in an acute rupture, you can put a ventriculostomy in the frontal region while you're in there. Okay, another question. Uh, are you using regularly intraoperative monitoring for cavernous sinus surgery? I do use uh, cavernous, uh, like sem somatosensitive potentials, brainstem evoked responses. Um, I don't use, I have used cranial nerve monitoring, but I found that it was um, stopping me from doing my dissection because every time I touch the nerve, it makes a noise. And then I decided, well, if, I, if I'm dissecting properly, there is no reason why the nerves should not uh, recover. Now, if you're starting, you're uncomfortable, uh, you want to dissect or stimulate to find where the nerves and you think it will help you, sure. So in my cases, I have stopped using them because I'm very comfortable with the anatomic dissection uh, and it, it slows me down. But uh, whatever you feel it will make your surgery safer, do it. Okay. You, you, uh, you see any questions in the chat that you think should be asked there? There's a couple, or I, I can pick one out. Okay, sometimes we see bradycardia with the manipulation of the third nerve. Do you have an explanation for that? Um, I think uh, it is a vasovagal response. It is very uh, known, you know, in the old days when somebody had tachycardia, they used to put pressure in their eyes to slow the heart rate down. So, uh, yes, it is. The only thing, the most important thing about it is tell the, the anesthesiologist that you're close to the third nerve because if they have bradycardia, all what you have to do is to tell you, you will stop and then you start the, the dissection again. Because if you're not connecting with your anesthesiologist, they will give the patients medication. And then when you take your hand off the third <coughs> one, suddenly you have a heart rate of 200 because they gave medications to speed up the heart. So this is usually should not be treated pharmacologically. You just tell them, Whenever you have a slow heart rate, let me know. You just back off or you change your approach. Okay, anybody in the panel have comments or questions? Uh, there was one uh, question about the tissue clue. Sorry. Okay, go ahead, you are. Okay. Go ahead. There was one question about the tissue clue, how to inject and where fibrin clue, yeah. tissue clue. Yeah. Well, the fibrin glue story started with you, actually. Uh, I was in uh, Helsinki and I saw he injected it when he was doing a basilar artery into the tentorium, into the veins. And then when I, uh, later I was thinking about it and I thought, well, maybe I can use it more in the cavernous sinus uh, instead of putting Sergicel and stuff. And it worked well. And we published a paper with there's my name and Yoha's name on it. And uh, the the... The, the cavernous sinus has um, three main uh, draining system which you have to be careful with uh, when you inject. I usually try to inject between V1 and V2 and in the direction of a medial posterior towards the bulk of the cavernous sinus. And when you inject, you, you don't want to be scared when it's bleeding suddenly and you end up injecting a lot because then it starts going into everywhere. Uh, you inject enough to slow down the bleeding, and then if you wait a little bit, the fibrin glue expands. When it expands, it impacts the cavernous sinus, and it slows down the bleeding. And then as you're dissecting, you may have to remove a 
and then chase the bleeding as you go. Now, the things you have to be careful of, if you're injecting between V1 and V2 in some patient, there is a big communicating channel that comes from the ophthalmic system, ophthalmic superior and inferior ophthalmic veins. You have to be careful because if you inject towards the veins, it is <coughs> possible you may impact the venous drainage of the eye and that can be a problem. The second thing is uh, when you are injecting um, in the vicinity of the sphenoparietal sinus, the sphenoparietal sinus comes around the temporal lobe, usually goes either between V1 and V2 or v, V3, V2, V3, and occasionally it turns around all the way towards the superior petrosal sinus. When you want to inject, uh, if you inject without disconnecting it from the cavernous sinus, the glue will go back into the uh, sylvian veins and you don't want that to happen. So what I do usually is I compress the sphenoparietal sinus so nothing goes back into the brain and then inject in the direction of the cavernous sinus and then coagulate and cut this connection. The third one, which is most dangerous, it could be, is the superior petrosal sinus. When I go back to the superior petrosal sinus, I usually put a piece of gel foam dipped with the seal. It sticks, but you do not want to inject into the sinus because it can retrograde back either to the sigmoid sinus or the more problem is if it retrogrades into the petrosal veins and goes to the brainstem. You don't want that to happen. So the best direction is towards the basilar plexus on the medial side, towards the dorsum cellae and the basilar plexus. And inject in a way not to forcefully pack it, just to impact it in a way. OK. More comments, questions from the panel? Go ahead. One, 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 there was one important question. From which book can we learn good microsurgical anatomy? Okay. Ali? From, from the laboratory. I think, laboratory. I think from the laboratory. You have to go to the lab. There is no other way. Now, there are the Roten books. They are good, but the Roten books are not surgical oriented books. They are more anatomic description books. So, but to simulate surgery, it is good to use the Roten uh, publications, but at the same time to, to dissect and simulate the surgery in the lab. You have to do it. Now, Professor Yazagil books are great because they have all the surgical approaches delineated in them. And that will be a good uh, guide for how to do your approaches in a way. Okay. okay. Go ahead. You are... No. Are there any other questions? Y yes. Or I, I have a question, please, uh, Professor Krish. Thank you very much for uh, uh, your, uh, you? your... Yes, how are you? Fine. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your excellent uh, lecture as usual, and uh, thank you, your Professor okay. uh, Yuha, for your... Uh, uh, sharing. Uh, actually, uh, I have uh, just uh, from your experience, what you suggest for us for uh, this section in this uh, very uh, uh, delicate uh, lectures, uh, uh, I mean structures uh, what, like uh, ICA when uh, you uh, dissect. Uh, what do you think in your experience the most uh, uh, harmful for these uh, vessels? Is it um, um, coagulation with the bipolar near uh, the uh, ICA or the, uh, or the vessels or the, the uh, traumatic uh, injuries during this uh, dissection in the tumor surgery. And what do you suggest to, to uh, how to protect these structures in uh, such uh, surgeries? Yeah, the, the carotids are still one of the last frontiers that we can, we should kind of conquer in the cavernous sinus because they vary. In pituitary tumors, for example, they're, in the majority of them, they're very pleasant to dissect. 
because you can peel the tumor off the artery in the majority of times. In meningiomas, they can be infiltrating in the wall. In those cases, you have to really use the microdopplers and uh, visualize it first with the Doppler, and then you use certain landmarks, which again, there's so many details to talk about, which will come with more knowledge of the anatomy. The other thing is you have to be careful with the variations of the carotid. The carotid artery, in the same way intracranially, if you open the basilar, there's a long basilar, a short basilar, a tortuous basilar, a basilar curve to the right, basilar curve to the left. The cavernous carotid has the same thing. So you get a CT angiogram, you map it well, you see how it correlates with the MR. So you can intraoperatively follow it. Now, how to find it is anatomy. You have to know where to look for it. You find the nerves, you know its relationship to the nerve, and you track it. And, and that's the way. Now, in meningiomas, you can coagulate tangentially once you clean everything and leave a sleeve around the carotid, but you don't want to poke into it. There are certain meningiomas which are pleasant and soft. They can peel off nicely but a good bulk of them are very invaded into the wall and it's better to leave it. Now, in very young people with aggressive tumors, I usually do a balloon test occlusion because these patients are gonna come back and I want to go to a Simpson grade one in the cavernous sinus and I may take the carotid completely out if they have good collaterals. I don't push it to do bypass and do it like cancer surgery because it's not cancer surgery. But that's how it is. With chordomas, it's easier. Also, the tumor is soft. You can peel it off. The, men the meningiomas, it's a lot of knowledge of anatomy and careful dissection and mapping of the curve. Second next question, please. Uh, I, I noticed that you the, the divide the uh, uh, posterior communicating many times in your uh, operations. Did you take your decision uh, before surgery on the DSA? And the collaterals, no. or just in the operative, you take your decision? No, I, I usually uh, decide intra op if I need to. I look at the aneurysm, see if I, if I feel first you have to have a hypoplastic aneurysm, I mean, a PCOM. PCOM. It should be smaller than the P1. If it is large, I would not take it. And mm -hmm. if it is smaller and it's in the way, if it's not in the way, I will not take it. Only if it's needed. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome, Joe. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Ali Christ. Yes, Go ahead. Uh, extremely, extremely useful lecture for experts and also for young neurosurgeons. Uh, I agree with you. The best way to understand anatomy of this very complex area is working in lab anatomy. There is no other way. Yes. Lab, lab anatomy is the best. Thank you, doctor, I, for great I presentation. Agree fully. Yeah. Thank you. I agree fully. Okay. More comments, questions? Do from the yes. Go ahead. Yes, John, this is Dr. Ali Lagari from uh, Pakistan. Welcome. I just wanted to, uh, an excellent talk by uh, Ali Krish, and uh, I'm a fan of you, Dr. Ali Krish. Uh, I, I, I first uh, heard your talk when you were giving a talk with um, uh, Professor um, Yasek Gil. It was impressive, now I'm a fan of you. But anyhow, my brief question was, what if you give injury to carotid, what will you do intraoperative while dissecting around cavernous sinus for tumor, not for aneurysm? And the second question is, what if you injure third nerve or fourth nerve? In fact, you sever it, for example, you just severed it. Now what would you do? Uh, what will yeah. be your advice if you have not done it? You know, the third nerve, I would say you shouldn't injure it. 
If you injure it, it's because you didn't know what's going on. You really shouldn't injure the third nerve. Um, it's, it's, to me, it's kind of inexcusable. And uh, that means there is something missing in the information because it's a large nerve. And if you find it proximal and distal, you can bridge into it. And if you know the anatomy of the pathology, you know how it's distorted. That's third nerve. Fourth nerve, again, the best thing is to dissect it, not injure it. The one that I injured, I beautifully dissected it, but the cotinoid that I put on it, it it's a very flimsy nerve. I always say that the fourth nerve is the most suicidal nerve. It likes to die because even after you dissect it, it kind of easy disrupt. In that case, I put it back together like end to end and just put glue. You don't want to put stitches. I don't think stitches would work. The carotid artery, I handle it like any other area of the brain. Number one, you have to be comfortable as a vascular surgeon. Uh, you don't want to panic. And depends on the type of injury. If it is something that I can small, I can coagulate, I will coagulate. If I need to put a stitch, I'll put a stitch. And uh, you don't want to panic. You don't want to overreact. Uh, you want to... The, the most important thing of injury of an artery is, number one, you have to remember what was the last thing you were doing when this happened? Because then you will know what happened. And number two is to be able to visualize what happened. The worst thing is to blindly start reacting and doing things without knowing what happened. You just have not to be scared from blood. You just put little pressure and you, sometimes all what you need is to put a little piece of gel foam and it stops. Now in the cavernous sinus, when you're operating, there are uh, the intracavernous arteries which come out like inferolateral trunk, the meningeal hypoxial and all its branches they get enlarged in meningiomas and they bleed and sometimes they can scare you like you think you injured the carotid. So with experience, you will know, you know, usually when, when somebody tells me, you know, if my fellow is somebody dissecting and they say, oh, I think I may have injured the carotid, um, that usually it tells me that I will look at it and most likely they are nervous and it magnifies in their mind the bleeder from an artery. It feels like it is the artery. When the carotid is injured, you will know. So you will, if, you, if somebody says, I may have injured the carotid, it's not the carotid. You will know if something, because it's a different type of bleeding. But again, you have to know what, what was the last thing you were doing, and then to see what happened. You will have to understand before you fix it. If you try to fix blindly, you may make it worse. Sometimes you may not have to do anything. Like for example, in one case, I was trying to remove tumor and the tumor cracked the artery. So all that I did is I coagulated the tumor together and that's it, it stopped the bleeding. And then I put a little packing on it and that's it, you leave it alone. I hope I answered your question. Now, yeah, of course, I, I, I of was course just wondering, have, repairing sorry. the vessel, yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, you, you have to also be prepared when you, when you're, especially when you're young and starting and, and you have to go get proximal and distal control, you want to be uh, calm and comfortable. It, it, here's an advice. Do not do an operation you're not comfortable doing. Very simple. You know, don't venture, don't try, don't say, well, I'll see how it goes. Go prepare. When you're prepared and you go in, everything goes your way. You don't want to be nervous doing an operation. I am not nervous doing an operation. When I go to the operation, I'm looking forward because I enjoy what I'm doing. I'm relaxed and I know that I'll handle it. The other thing that I should say also it's important to have a good team. If you don't have a good team, it's a problem. You need to have good anesthesia, 
the nurses know what you're doing. Everybody in your operating room should be positive, should be wanting you to succeed. If there is somebody who's like, uh, if I have some, sometimes I have visitors who's coming just to see when something will go wrong, I will kick them out. I don't want anybody in my room who is not wishing me to succeed because they will be distracting you. Everything, you have to pay attention to your environment. You have to have a perfect condition so that if something goes wrong, you don't have to worry about anything except taking care of this problem. And you feel comfortable, you're in the right hand. You know, I have many cases. I have a patient sent to me with a growing uh, M M1 aneurysm that bled fusiform. When I operated, I didn't realize that the surgeon who operated before didn't really mention in his operating room that they had a, they had a problem. The artery was <laughs> had a crack in it that they packed. Later, I found out. When I was operating it, the artery cracked when I was dissecting it. But I had the right team. We reacted. Even the anesthesiologist didn't know that something happened. Why? Because I had the right team and the right approach and you relax. So all these conditions have to be available before you operate. Surgery is not only technical steps. Surgery is a preparation. You know, when I'm doing an operation like Kevin a sinus, the other day we did uh, a few months ago, two months ago, basilar aneurysm, and it took like two hours. And then my, you know, somebody commented, oh, it only took two hours. I said, no, it took 30 years and two hours and the right team. That's how long it take, took. Excellent. You know? Completely. Okay. I think this was a good end of the session. Very good saying. So very good advice. Have a good team, supporting team around. No angry eyes around you wishing you to fail to fail so this is the supporting team good team spirit and uh, helping all uh, helping the most important person in the operation room the patient so i yes. think uh, it was excellent lecture i think ali now you have to go to outpatient clinic to to do what uh, to go to outpatient clinics Yes, you have to go to yes, clinic so now <laughs> you can't yeah. avoid it yeah I, <laughs> So, okay, I thank you, everyone. Okay. So, thank you. You're very good. Next Friday, and uh, we have to say that uh, tomorrow, Ali. Thank you. Ubuntu yeah. and Professor Yasaki are giving a webinar. Yeah, tomorrow we have a webinar which will be uh, 10 a.m. Uh, Central Time in the U.S., which is uh, in 30 minutes from now tomorrow. It will be started. So. Uh, don't miss it. We have a, a series, a cerebrovascular series, which we are putting together with Professor Yazigil on uh, bypass AVMs and uh, and uh, uh, aneurysms. And I may actually you have ask you to participate in the AVM uh, session with Professor. Okay, great. We hope to televise both of them. Uh, excellent, Dr. Ali. Thank you very much. And if uh, we're going to end this broadcast with a poll, this is new. This is like I'm a neurosurgeon trying a new procedure. It's the first time I've done it. So, uh, okay, it, you, you can vote by going to your smartphone and typing in www.kahoot.it. Okay, and that brings you to a screen where it asks a pin. You put the pin in there. And just log in. I'll give you a minute to get in there so you can vote with your smartphone. It has questions about the conference and the conference setting. We're just trying to uh, get a little better at this. And it's also in Chinese, uh, Ben. Uh, this poll is in Chinese too. So they can participate, the Chinese uh, uh, brothers in the neurosurgery in Chinese, brothers and sisters in Chinese. So I'll just wait a second here. Okay, I'll start. I'll start it off, and you can join as you come along. Okay. Okay. This is. 
to just Professor wipe. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, ten, tonight in, in China, uh, there's around uh, 3,000 audience to attend this webinar. Congratulations. Okay. This is a pretty obvious question. <laughs> Are you seeing those, you guys? Okay. What about the length of the presentation? Just punch it in there if you like. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, did I get Okay. That, that's in Chinese. It says, what areas of neurosurgery would you like to see more of? Uh, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, big data. These are the questions of things you may want to see more of. I can go Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. okay, last one. If we type the interactive neuroanatomy web site, would you participate? You will. Okay, but the, I'm going to have a free day. Sunday's working day. Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, let's see here. Okay. <laughs> now, okay, thank you. Now I just have to figure out how to, how to put the results on. I'm sorry I don't know that yet, uh, but I will post it. So thanks everybody for coming and I'll publish the results of the polls. And thanks, you are. Thank you. Zubin, thank you thank very you, much. Thank you. Zubin, yeah, I forgot to point out that Zubin had translated the whole thing into Chinese. Uh, thank okay, you. No, thank you. Yes, tonight uh, there's around 3,000 uh, audience. Oh, that's okay. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zubin, very nice to see you. Can, can bye spell? Bye. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to stay here. Okay. I'm going to just stay okay. here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye. you are. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The, the reason, uh, can someone post the... Uh...